in all serious, uh, seriousness, uh, Carrie, thanks for inviting me to come talk about NamUs. Most of you know about NamUs. Many of you are users, case managers. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit simplistic. But for those of you that no, don't know enough about NamUs or anything about NamUs, uh, everything you've learned so far this week, the results of those analyses, you can put into NamUs. So if you have unidentified people in your jurisdictions, you can put all of that and a whole lot more into the unidentified, the UP side of NamUs. Uh, why am I standing here? <clears throat> well, Carrie, you have to answer that. But I've been involved with NamUs for four or five years, I guess, uh, before it was NamUs. It started out with Randy Hanslick and the UDRS system uh, out of Fulton County in Georgia. And then they started building a missing person site. So NamUs actually evolved, even though it's one set, it's a set of two databases, missing person database and an unidentified person's database linked together. But it started out as two separate databases. Uh, the missing person's database was developed uh, chiefly at the NFSTC in Largo, Florida. And the unidentified side was, uh, was developed uh, just down the highway in, uh, at Central Florida under uh, Cary uh, Whitcomb's group. But they are merged. We have been live now since, I think, uh, January of 2009. Uh, and it's a growing set of records, both missing persons and unidentified. For you anthropologists and you people who work you know, in, the, in the death investigation field, uh, it's the best tool you're probably ever going to see in your career for managing uh, unidentified cases and trying to link them to uh, missing persons cases. I can't hardly envision how we functioned before we had NamUs. Our office has 600 unidentified uh, people going back about 20 years. And uh, even though we still use paper binders, three ring binders, uh, uh, NamUs now allows us, uh, when we get a phone call or an email, we just go right to NamUs. We don't go to those binders first, although they have a lot of information in them. We don't even go to our own, our own database for our office, which is VertiQ. We, uh, we go right to NamUs. So I know a lot, of, a lot of you do the same thing. You store all the information that you have on your unidentified people uh, in NamUs. And uh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. For the anthropologists in the office or in the audience today, uh, what you may not know is that some two-thirds or three-fourths of all the cases on the unidentified side in NamUs are either skeletal or decomposed, which means they should have got or should get someday an anthropological examination, which puts anthropologists in a really good position to be major players in NamUs, the data entry and then the, mon and then data entry and then the uh, good data entry, quality data entry, because obviously the database is only as good as the, <laughs> the information in it. Then becoming case managers of those cases and then waiting for, as Clyde and I were just talking about, waiting for the emails from the cyber sleuths to come in and say, hey, could you check this MP case with this UP case? And you could get a full-time job in the future. Uh, funding may be, funding may be a, an issue, but uh, it will become a full-time job. has become a full-time job for me just managing the cases that we have in NamUs. So that's why I'm here. I, I know a bit about the system. Our, our office, my office, the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner in Tucson, Arizona, uses it daily. And uh, uh, Beth Murray's name is undermined because these are her slides. Uh, we've been putting on these dog and pony shows uh, under Steve Clark's group uh, around the country for the last year and are going to do another one in Los Angeles. They're called NamUs Academies. And in, in the NamUs Academies, five people, professionals from each state, usually a forensic specialist, one, one person from law enforcement, one missing persons advocate, a cop type, and an MLI are selected. And these five people from each state, and we've done three of these academies so far, the LA uh, a meeting in two weeks will be the fourth. Uh, these five people are then supposed to go disseminate the good word of, uh, of NamUs, both on the missing person side and the uh, unidentified person side. But uh, since Beth already came up with a these uh, teaching slides, we thought, why, why reinvent the wheel and we'll just uh, slap my name over hers and uh, we'll go from there. So has anybody here not put a case in NamUs? No. Well, you're going you're to want to. You're going to want to. Uh, and we're going to show you how easy it is. So this is what we're going to try to do in the first hour today and then after lunch when we have a little, uh, little uh, hands-on and we put some cases in ourselves. Uh, 
We're just going to concentrate on the un unidentified or UP side because most of us will be doing that. A uh, few of us, although some of us might put missing persons cases in. Uh, they're virtually identical databases. The screens are virtually identical, but there are some little, little variations. But let's just uh, concentrate on the UP side because that's what most of uh, your talents will be used for if you, if you decide to use a, a NamUs in the future. And again, the most important thing about the database is to put accurate information in. Uh, if you don't know Ancestry, we have a, a convenient little drop down that says unknown. Okay. What, what's the use of that? You don't exclude anybody on the missing person side if you put unknown. If you shoot from the hip and say Caucasian, or can I say that word? I can't say Caucasian, I can't say Caucasian. If you, if you shoot, shoot from the hip and say Caucasian, and that person may be Caucasian, but the family doesn't list him as Caucasian, you'll never find that person in Amos. At least the, the, uh, the uh, algorithms won't find that person in Amos. They will exclude that person. So <coughs> quality data, quality data is the key. So that's the first page on the unidentified persons uh, 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 system. You want to log in using that, uh, uh, that login. Now, the URL is an ORG. Both, both of the independent uh, databases are, are or, ORGs, but NamUs is actually a GOV. So it's www.namus.gov is the umbrella URL, but the two databases are, uh, are under uh, orgs. <coughs> you can start a case. Once you log in and get the appropriate uh, permissions, and those of you that are already, are already users, you know what that means. You have to be sponsored by somebody, a coroner or a medical examiner. If you're working in that office or you're a forensic anthropologist for, or a medical legal investigator for that person, all you need is that person's permission. NamUs, the administrators of NamUs have a list of every medical legal official, the head of all those offices, county by county in every state. They have their phone number, they have their address, they have their email address. So once you get that person's approval and you, you enter that yourself uh, when you, uh, when you uh, register, uh, then it's as easy uh, and a couple of days worth of, uh, of emails before you're activated. Okay, so you're in. You start a new case and it's, uh, what, 10 pages? Name this is, I think it's 10 pages, maybe 11. The first one is for information. So you can just read these blocks. I don't have to read everything. Uh, the, the red asterisks, though, are important because you can't get a case, you, you can't get a case published in NamUs or approved in NamUs and, uh, unless these red asterisks uh, fields are filled in. So you have to pay attention to those. There's a lot of information you can not put in. You can wait a while. You, you can start a case and, and add to it later. But you have to hit these, uh, these asterisk fields uh, where it says required, required fields marked with that red asterisk. So probably the most important number is going to be the case number, your medical legal case number, your ML number, your ME number, your MEC number, whatever, whatever you use. Uh, you, you probably don't want to use a police report number here. There's a, there's a police page. You'll see down here that there is a police information page. You can put that, you can put that number there. And you use a calendar function to get the date found. Uh, that's the date the body's found, not the date you, you think the person died. <clears throat> you want to describe the current location of the remains. Uh, it can be as easy as just your, your, your address or the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office. If the remains, in, in some of these cases, especially the cold cases, they've been released already and they've been buried or cremated. If you can get that information from the public fiduciary's office or some other public uh, office within your county or your, your jurisdiction, you certainly can add, add that there. Save your data. Every, don't ever leave a page without hitting, <laughs> without hitting save. Uh, hit it a couple times. There's also a nice uh, floating save bar. Uh, you don't see it on this uh, printout here, but they've added a, a save uh, bar that floats with the, uh, uh, as you scroll down the, uh, the page. It's a very nice feature, but you got to save your data. So you do this, and all of a sudden you come up, and you get your you get your numbers in there, and you get your no your now new number seven three three three. That's your name as UP case number. That is a unique number. It's they, they're sequential. We're up in the nine thousands now, so this is a, a year or several months old. 
We'll also list your name. So Beth Murray put this case in, so now after that first page is saved, she becomes the, uh, the case manager. The case manager should be somebody with access to all the records. You may, you may not have access to the body or the bones or whatever remains there are, but you should have access to the case records. If you can't get the case records, you probably should let some other person who has, who has access to those records become case manager. And it's very simple uh, to go to the uh, contacts page and change case manager. Now, it, in my opinion, it's better to have someone like you in the room be case manager if you know a little bit about the case <laughs> than make somebody who won't answer email. And, and the reason I say that is this email address is the address that these cyber sleuths and families are going to contact. You're going to get these emails and phone calls in, in some cases. And, it's better if someone conscientious talks to the, the families and the cyber sleuths than somebody who doesn't care. So if you feel that the person with the, all, all the records and you can't get them all, and maybe the remains and, and they don't want to give the remains to you, if you feel that person won't do a good job as case manager, I'll leave that up to you. I tell you, tell you face to face. Then you can remain as, as case manager. Better to talk to a family with a little bit of information than to put this in someone else's hands who won't answer an email. And certainly we have, I speak from experience here, we have, we have changed our cases to a different case manager and then gotten emails from people saying, uh, hey, this person won't return my calls or answer my emails and I noticed you were also listed or you were listed one time in the past and you helped me out on a different case. So a word to the wise on that issue. Uh, you'll get these, uh, you get this nice red, uh, Highlight or write a line up here that says uh, the case does not meet requirements. Well, it doesn't yet because we haven't been to every page with all these red asterisk fields. Once we get to all the pages and we fill in all those required fields, then we can uh, then we can actually submit this for publication. And there's the save bar. That's the new save bar there. That's a very uh, very uh, 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 very nice to have. So we go to the next page. Oh, I guess we're going to summarize the case. Uh, information specifics. So if you want to use the one number and you want to know, want to list something about the, uh, the disposition. Many of these cases have multiple uh, reports, uh, autopsy reports, DNA reports, anthropology reports, odontology reports. Uh, you may have fingerprint records in there. Uh, there's a place to name this to, uh, to list all this. You don't have, you can put, you can put a lot in the comment section on the first page, but uh, uh, there's also specific pages and, and and the nice thing about the comments page is all that text is searchable so for instance we could put information like on id cards on the police page and, and we do but we also want to put that name an id card that we that seemingly can't be proven to be this person but, but we also want to get that name in the text fields on the circumstances because an id a matching id could be as simple as a family typing in their son's name <laughs> and searching, and it'll search all the text fields. That, is, that has happened before. Okay, the demographics page. So the anthropologists, uh, anthropologists probably have something to say on virtually every one of these pages, more so. There's a couple of pages that uh, MLIs uh, typically do, but anthropologists can weigh in, and, and, and the results of our, uh, our analyses can be entered in on a variety of pages. But obviously, this is a big one. Age, race, eth ethnicity, eth ethnicity, sex, height, and weight can all be put uh, on the demographics page. <clears throat> now, you can read all this yourself. I don't have to read it for you. But as far as weight, it, should, it goes without saying, but some people have put the weight of the bones. They've weighed the bones and put that in the weight. Now, weight is a searchable field in NamUs. So if you put 18 pounds of bones, you're not going to find any adult. You might find some kids, but you're not going to find any adult. And this, is, this has happened, and I'll tell you how critical it can be. Uh, there, there's a way to adjust the, the parameters around weight, but we had a case of a dismemberment like a couple of years ago. We had everything but the hands and the feet and the head. So uh, I don't know what head weighs or hands and feet weigh, but we had about 180 pounds of everything else. This was a 230-pound, 225-pound man, and the person doing the data entry saw the 180 and so that sounds reasonable and that's kind of what we do in our in our office uh, not only I put case, do I put cases in but a lot of students do we say if it's you know if it's 90 pounds or 70 pounds for an adult it's someone who's dehydrated or mummified maybe partly skeletalized don't put that in there but if it sounds reasonable so we, we put in 180 pounds 
And we, for two or three months, we, NamUs couldn't find the guy who was in the, on the missing person side of NamUs because his family had him 230. So the parameters, I think, were 10 or 20 pounds. So they went down to 210, up to 250. So eventually we found out it was the right guy, but we could have done it. We could have done it. Uh, the, the algorithms would have found him as a potential match had we put unknown. So in a case like that of a, of a uh, dismemberment or, uh, or decomposed or, or dehydrated body, unless you can calculate with a pretty good degree of accuracy what you think that person weighed, is put unknown or, ca or can't measure. <clears throat> it's better to be broader in NamUs. It's better to cast a wide, or if, you, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your uh, intervals are, are wider, uh, the algorithms have a better chance to, uh, to find that person. Now, that doesn't mean <coughs> NamUs totally requires these algorithms to find matches. Quite the opposite. Most of the matches are found by people. It used to be that you and I had to do it, or the police had to do it, or the medical examiner had to do it. Now anybody can do it. There were kids who get on this website and play this, we're told, as a game. You know, here's the dead guy. Go find a list of uh, missing people that might match. Now, whether you want to use it at that way as a game, kind of like the geocaching, if you will, or you're the mother looking for her missing daughter. Still, it's a lot of eyeballs on the computer screen. So we're fond of saying in name is that you work eight hours a day, but your cases are worked 24 hours a day, or at least your cases can be worked 24 hours a day. So regardless of the intentions or the motivation of the people using NamUs, you get these, <coughs> you get these emails sent to you saying, hey, compare this case with that case. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes they have found uh, Carrie could tell you more about that. They have found a match. <clears throat> so, okay, required fields. Uh, body condition is uh, in PMI or, or, or semi-important. Although I have to tell you, with uh, with PMI, you can type in <clears throat> you can type in the postmortem interval like 10 to 20 months, but it won't be saved as that. So, uh, if you didn't know this, this is important to point out right now. Let's say you had somebody, let's say you had a skeleton that came in in, in, <clears throat> in August of 2011 and you thought it was one to two years. You could type in 2009 to 2010 in here, that'll be saved. But for the interval, leave that blank. And for the uh, units here, this drop down, just put years. Because if you type, again, 10 to 20 months, it won't come out. That's, that's a problem with their name is that they, they're working on. But uh, what happens is you end up getting something that says 10. And then you see months. And then some people could interpret that as, oh, he died 10 months ago. He was found on this date. He died 10 months ago to the date when we know in the room you, you can't estimate the PMI to, to the date. So that's a little glitch right now, but uh, I think they're working on it. But uh, it's something that uh, for all cases you entered uh, 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 subsequently, you should probably pay attention to that. If you do have some cases in NamUs already, and you have a free half an hour, an hour when you're at home, go back to that page of all your cases while you're logged in and just edit that out. Edit that out. <clears throat> it, can only, it wouldn't be confusing to you because you'll see it and you'll think, what, what does that mean? I, I, I typed in 10 to 20 months, but to somebody who's searching and they see that, it could be confusing to them. <clears throat> so now we have age, age range, race, and sex are all shown. They're all the highlighted fields are, are shown. If you can't estimate the weight, just put you cannot estimate. Uh, if you reconstruct, if you, excuse, excuse me, if you, uh, if you estimate the stature from the length of a long bone, then put estimated. If that person is measured crown heel at the autopsy, then put measured. That's the two possibilities, estimated and measured. So even though we can't put in plus or minus three inches, if we say estimated, it's kind of implied that uh, it, could go, uh, it could go a few inches either way. I think if anything, they're, we're gonna, they're going to stop using stature. We stopped using weight as a primary criterion because of the issue with the bones and the decomps and the dismemberments. But uh, uh, there, there's some talk about uh, not using that anymore. Or educating people to how to change the search parameters so you, you don't exclude someone like that. You know, stature is very problematic. We, <laughs> you know, we can, we can, as anthropologists, you know, we can estimate it and be pretty sure that we, we know how tall this person was. But if the family doesn't have that recorded, or the guy, you know, lied about his height, or the woman lied about her height, uh, or, or didn't know the height. Uh, perhaps, yeah. perhaps we should just put in estimated regardless of whether we measure them or not. Yeah. 
But when we do searches, uh, that, that wouldn't be a bad idea. When we do searches, we just go up and uh, we, we broaden that out to plus or minus six inches. We figure the, fa the family probably knows within a foot how tall that person was. But, but the families may not conduct, conduct their search, searches that way. Okay, so kind of summarizing the demographics page. <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you say something, and this sounds simplistic, but it's, it's relatively important. If you estimate an age to be 45 uh, or a, a 25 to 45, then you also want to go to the, the drop down that says pre-50. If you estimate 30 to 50, then you should say pre-60, because if you believe the person could be 50, then they're, they're not pre-50, they're pre-60. Uh, the age, uh, uh, except for the kids, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, always put unsure. If, 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 you're not, if you're not positive, put unsure because, uh, like I said, those algorithms uh, will exclude people uh, if we're wrong. And we know as anthropologists, you know, we can be wrong on ancestry. We can be wrong on everything. We can be wrong on age and, and, and even sex at, at times. Uh, but uh, always put unsure if, if, you're, if you're not sure. Uh, the mixed ancestry, uh, uh, if it has mixed, mixed, if it appears to be of mixed ancestry, whether you're doing this from skeletal remains or just looking at a, uh, a deceased body, you can describe that in circumstances of death. But again, what a family puts down for the ethnicity or ancestry or race of a person, and what we put down, you know, could be different things, and that could be the basis of exclusion. So. Uh, we thought about, and we still might do it, we may go to all of our cases, all 600, and change race to unsure. We're not getting a lot of hits. We're not getting a lot of uh, matches. So we thought about doing that on some cases just to see if we get more hits. Uh, so you can play around. You, you can change things. And when you're case manager on your UP side, you can broaden things out. So let's say you only have one. Let's say you're lucky enough to be in a jurisdiction you only have one unidentified person. So every day you can, devo you can devote a half an hour or an hour to that. You can go change your parameters in, in this and see uh, under potential matches if you can actually, you know, get a few. And then you can, you can uh, if, if they're in the, I mean, obviously the missing, the missing person's report has to be a name as for you to do this. If, if, if the family hasn't taken the time to put the missing person that you have the body of in name as, it's, this is not going to work. But if the assumption is that the person might be in there, then it's not a, a, not, not a bad way to uh, use some of your time. Okay, weight, weight and height, uh, you want to uh, use the estimated or measured uh, or cannot be estimated. You have, to choose, you have to choose one of them. The system will not let you publish it if you, uh, if you uh, don't do it. Uh, don't use zeros. If you can't, uh, leave a blank and say you can't estimate, but don't, don't put zeros in there. The algorithms will actually get confused and search on that. And we talked about uh, decom decoms and skeletons and, uh, and dismemberments. Body condition and, and time since death. Um, if you have a recognizable face, there should be a photograph of that face. Now, we know some cases or you know, photographs weren't taken or they've been lost. But the, another power of nameless is the images page. You can put as many images and are encouraged to put as many images as you can there because the families are looking. So images of the face are great. You know, they got to be relatively, uh, relatively uh, uh, a decent uh, photograph. Uh, Dr. Hanslick, who uh, Mark works for, uh, <coughs> probably wouldn't allow a decomposed face to be put on there. Now you can you can put any image on there and say, don't make it viewable to the public, and then only we can see it, and law enforcement can see it. But if you want the public to help identify your Jane or John Doe, uh, just put. Just put photos out there that you think, you know, the parents or the, the siblings or the friends could, could get some information from, but they, would just, they wouldn't be horrified by seeing the condition of a, of a decomposed space. <coughs> Circumstances. So here we can fill in the, uh, the state. You have to fill in the state and the counties. It's a drop down. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the post was done somewhere else, you can list the other agency. Uh, you enter cause and manner if you want. It's never <coughs> viewable to the, to the uh, public, so the public can never see cause and manner. If you want to put it in there, in, in there you, if, you can put it, if you want to put it there, you can, or you can put it on, the, on a police page, but it's never, never viewable to the public. The circumstances of recovery are, are good because this, here's where you can put down <coughs> names and, and some other, some other uh, uh, clues uh, uh, or some other uh, um, 
terms that a family might be searching on. And when they do a search uh, on the UP side, this is one of the text boxes that, that is searched, uh, uh, as well as a few other text boxes. So it's a good place to put in uh, two or three or four sentences. Now, we'll cut you off after about, I think it's 160 characters. So there's a, there's a space limitation on, on this. Uh, but uh, you can you got two or three sentences to get in all the, um, all the pertinent information. Uh, we, still don't, uh, we still don't have enough to be, uh, uh, to be published, uh, but uh, we're working at it. Uh, but you also notice that we have a star now. Does a star show up? We have a, a five-star system. So one being the lowest, actually no stars being the lowest, but the goal is to, to kind of get all five of those stars lit up in, in yellow. And you can do that by putting in a facial image and putting in fingerprint information and putting in dental information and putting in DNA information. You don't have to have it all, but if you have some combination of those things, uh, you will, uh, you'll get up to four or five stars. In circumstances of death here, is that where you put the possible name of the individual if you... We, we do. We do. We do because, again, that's, that's searchable, and if the family just searches on that name, it'll, it'll come up there. Yeah. Now, I'll leave it up to you as far as images page, and we'll get there in a minute, but uh, we, uh, we put, uh, we scan ID cards, especially if they're thought to be fake or bogus or uh, uh, fraudulent. Uh, if that person doesn't appear to exist in that state or that country, and our investigators say this is a, this is a bogus card, we'll scan the whole card. Now, there could be some sensitive information on there, but we, th we think that by putting that out there, making it viewable to the public, if the name is close to the guy's name, or if the state or the birth date are, 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 are the same for the missing person, it's a potential lead. Uh, because this is web-based and anybody has access to it, uh, you know, you can right-click any image and, and take it. You, you, can, you can download anything off this you want, and uh, the security issue is there, of course. And uh, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, we haven't been bitten by this yet, by identity theft or something like that, where it's been traced back to us, and we had to, we had to answer to why we put that potentially sensitive information on, 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 on the NamUs webpage. Uh, if that happens, we may change our policy. But right now, we think any and all information that comes in with that body could be a clue to identify that body. And again, we've had enough fraudulent ID cards where the name was either the same except for a middle name, uh, or the name was different, but the birth date was the same. It's like people won't lie about everything. Like they'll, they'll selectively lie, but it's like, I can't remember a whole new identity, so I'll just change my birth date, but I'll keep my name. So who knows on that card what might actually be something that's searchable by the families. So that, that's our policy. Uh, each jurisdiction probably uh, might, may feel differently about that. Uh, so just summarize the uh, circumstances pages. Um, address is good. If you have GPS coordinates, uh, please get them in there. If you have two different or three different ways to describe it, like the GPS coordinates, and then maybe five miles south of milepost so-and-so on route so-and-so, put that in there. If you have something else, like you know, three blocks from the church uh, on whatever street, you, can, uh, you don't have street addresses. Obviously, if you have street addresses, uh, that's good. In Arizona, most of our decedents are nowhere near a named street, let alone a number. But if the person dies in the city, of course, this, the street address is, 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 is fine, is fine. Um, question. If, if the ME's office is going to get a DNA, let's say they think they have a possible ID, and they're going to get a DNA sample, do you, or would you wait to put this in, or would you wait, and, or go ahead and put it in and just wait for them to get Who's been waiting more than a year for DNA results from a DNA lab? <laughs> and you have to have them, if you're going to use UNT, they have to be a NamUs. If you want a free exam at UNT, they have to be a NamUs. So my, my answer to you is, I would say put them in right away. We typically wait about a, a couple of weeks to a month to let the finger, if they have fingerprints, if they have anything identifiable, if the police even act like they're interested in helping us identify this person, which is not always the case, especially with foreign nationals. We kind of let the normal thing run for two or three weeks. If bones come in with no ID cards, we, we put, we'll put those in NamUs the day we do the anthropology exam. And we'll cut the, we'll cut the bone sample for DNA that day. So I, I would say put them in there earlier just because of the long wait for most DNA labs. You mentioned going back and looking at cases. Do you have the, or would we have the ability to selectively pull out our own cases by the case manager or whatever? Yeah. You get a dashboard. You get a dashboard that shows you all your cases. 
And then when you only have five or 10 of those, it, you, you, know, you can manage those. When you get up to 100 or 400, then you can do something called case tracking so you can get a subset of all your cases. Yeah, it's pretty easy to track your own <coughs> cases. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry about that. For the GPS coordinates, um, is there any preference for a system? No. 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 Either way. Anyway, either way. Okay, the physical medical page. A lot of, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you had a question. I'm sorry. Uh, since you mentioned case managers, uh, on our famous cases, Jenny Love is the case manager, and now I've been entering some of the cases into NamUs. But in the past, some of our cases were out of county. So as long as Jenny signed in, she can make adjustments to those out of county cases. I can't, I can only do Harris County. Um, is there a way? That's not a name. That's not a name. restriction. It's maybe something in Harris County. All you have to do is ask Jennifer if she would, uh, or uh, Sanchez, Dr. Sanchez. Yeah. So Jennifer is working under his name, just like I'm working under our chief medical examiner. All they have to do is act. I'm sorry. Uh, you don't have to do uh, Dr. Sanchez. You have to get the, the the coroner or medical examiner for those other counties to agree to do it. So, for instance, we currently have have a postdoctoral fellow and two pre-doctoral fellows, and they're, they're, they can put cases in, and uh, enter cases in four different counties in Arizona, just like I can. Uh, but we had to ask for that change, because there was a time when only I could do that. So if you want to edit those, those other county cases, uh, it's not a nameless restriction. You just have to uh, get the permission, and since Jen must have it, Jennifer Love must have a the permission from those county eight of them. She generally just makes the changes, but I just wanted to see if there was a way around it. Because, I mean, if, if, we ha if I have to make a change, instead of contacting the Justice of the Peace, I just tell Jennifer to make the change herself. Right, right. Said. That's why we change it in our uh, office, because I was getting these li <laughs> lists that you got to go in there and change it, because I can't get to your case. So I just asked Steve Clark, who, uh, who runs ORA, uh, he's one of the two architects of NamUs, uh, uh, if, if we could get the fellows permission to do those counties. And the, the, only, uh, the only requirement is that that medical examiner coroner for that county gives their approval. They have to know about it. And that's why I said, since Jennifer Love is already the case manager for those non-Harris County cases in Texas, I assume that's already been done. So uh, it probably would be as, e as easy as having Jen just send an email to Steve Clark and saying, I, you know, can you activate Deborah for these additional counties? And then you could have full edit. Yeah. So those of you that only have to deal with one county, that's, 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 that's nice. But most of us, especially the anthropologists in the room, you know, we, we extend beyond our county borders, and many of us do multiple counties. Some of you do the whole state, or may do the whole state. Some of you go, like Krista, in different states. So uh, that's a whole... That's just a difference in degree and not a difference in kind. So you can be activated for any of those counties that you work in in Indiana or Illinois, as long as you have the permission of those uh, medical legal uh, officers. But I had a question about that. Since coroners are an elected position and they rotate out pretty frequently, do you have to get continuing permission from each new coroner? Name, name is monitors that. The people at the people at ORA monitor this, if not yearly, at least yearly, and maybe during every election cycle. Yeah, everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, uh, um, registration expires after one year. So whenever you register, 12 months later, you'll get a notice that, you know, so you just have to say, I'm at the same address, I'm at the same this, you know, my boss is the same. If anything has changed, uh, you need to let uh, the administrators there, you can just send them an email uh, uh, that the things have changed and they'll, they'll verify that and then they'll just, they'll get you up for another year. We've also gotten a little more cautious with the address because we've had the web sleuths go out to scenes and just let me know that they didn't find anything there and they were going to interview some people in the area and law enforcement's like, can you kind of make it a little more vague? So instead of the southwest corner of the block, on the, it's just a vague intersection or a vague area of town, which is unfortunate. Well, you know, I think I mentioned geocaching a few minutes ago, and uh, there, there was an app, a computer app, that I was asked to sign off on <clears throat> that was all about, you know, you know what geocaching is. So this, this new app, this new geocaching game, was to go out and see death sites. 
So I didn't sign off on it. In fact, I told them they shouldn't do that, principally because some of these areas are so remote that the person going out there could die themselves. But the other consideration, I think, is Angela's hinting that you could get people, when you, when you put down the address, the, the grid coordinates, even though they're kind of fuzzy, uh, but if you can get somebody close and they can see perhaps, you know, where the person died by the condition of the soil, and they do a little search around it, uh, I'm sure they could find more, if the person was partly skeletalized, they could find more skeletal elements. So the last thing we want, we think, you could argue, I guess, that that would be a good thing if somebody went back to the site and, and got these remains. But if they don't call the law enforcement and you just get these kids that are out geocaching, then post something online that they found what looks like a rib bone at, this, at, at these grid coordinates, that's just gonna, that would create a nightmare for our office. So I don't think they made that app. Uh, we asked, we told them we could not participate in it and, and told them they shouldn't do it. But uh, that's a risk. And, and you know, this is all web-based. So all this information that's viewable to the public potentially is being used for other than good reasons. Yeah, so, well, what are you gonna, you know, so the greater good is that a lot of people can, can see it. And perhaps, and I, I didn't stress this strongly enough, the most important feature in NamUs has nothing to do with us in the room, unless you're missing somebody. The most important feature in NamUs is that it allows the families of the missing to actively search for their missing per loved one whenever they want, every night, you know. When, when the phone calls of the police are not returned or the phone calls to the private investigator are not returned and people just say, you know, lady, we don't have any new information. We don't, you know, we, we don't know what to do. Which is typical of, in a missing person's case after a few days or a few weeks or a few months. Now these families can go on and log on every night and they can search. And if you and I were doing our job and putting in recent unidentified cases, we may be putting in the daughter of one of these mothers who are looking every night to see if she's in there. So, uh, so with, with that in mind, uh, you know, good quality information and, and a lot of images, uh, uh, making it, while still technically and, 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 and ethologically correct, making it, you know, putting things in lay terms so the general public can actually uh, help us uh, solve these cases. Okay, the physical page, medical page, we can put in a variety of, uh, of things, uh, 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 hair color, eye color. Uh, if, if the person, for the anthropologist in the audience, if, if you've got an old healed fracture, you can, you can put in that. One of the things we're fond of doing, and this has happened several times, is we'll, we'll get a sternum that has four or five, uh, uh, that had a sternotomy, and it has four or five uh, stainless steel uh, uh, wires around it. So not only did we put that in there, that there are stainless steel wires and a, and a, and a healed sternum from, from open heart surgery, right? But we also put on, on the scar pages that there would be a, we say inferred, but we'd say we're gonna infer a vertical scar down the chest. Under medical stuff, we're gonna say probable, or we're gonna infer that the person had open heart surgery. Because those wires don't make any other sense than somebody got in there and, and touched that man's heart. So you put all that stuff in, and if you think about it, you think, well, that's kind of redundant, but what if a cousin knows he had open heart surgery but doesn't know about anything else? What if his neighbor has seen him without his shirt off and knows he has a scar but doesn't know anything else? You know, what if he's told somebody, hey, I, I go through the airport and that, and that thing goes off, the x-ray machine goes off, I got wires in my chest. So you don't know what a person knows about that missing person. So. When you find something on a bone, especially like a, a very, uh, uh, like a heel fracture, especially a very grossly heel fracture, you might infer that there could be possible scars on that leg. And that would give uh, the families who don't know about the bone being broken, but do know about the scar, uh, a, chance, uh, a chance to find that. Always save your data. Uh, be as detailed as you can. Uh, don't use all caps. I don't, Probably have to tell anybody in here, but occasionally we get cases, and cases are entered with all capital, uh, all capital letters. Uh, Randy doesn't like that. Dr. Hanslick doesn't like that. I don't, none of us like reading all caps either. So, so now you know because we have a uh, we have a scar on this person, we get a second yellow, we get a second yellow star. So uh, we're moving it up the the ladder, the a rung at a time to to being a, a strong case. So that if two things here. If that missing person is in the MP side of NamUs, the algorithms could potentially link the two. 
But even if that person isn't in the missing person site, the family or the friend of that missing person who's just cruising an unidentified website, even as a lurker, even as someone who isn't even logged in or registered, they can see all these things. And this, this, this happens a lot. This happens a lot where people that aren't even registered, they just go in there and they look at pictures and look at, look at uh, tattoo descriptions and scar descriptions and, and come up with possible matches. Chris. What, what, is, what do you think about official reconstruction putting us in the image? We put them in when that's the only thing we have. Now, we use the FBI. We use the FBI uh, uh, for a couple of reasons, but one of them is, boy, they're lifelike. They look like people. Not all forensic artists, I think, make a facial reconstruction or approximation look real. So these ones that the FBI are, have been cranking out for us, they're very realistic. Now, having said that, do they look like the person did in life? I don't know. Our, our, our po policy is to put those in if they're lifelike. Uh, however, this, this banner photo up here, this blue, uh, blue man up here, blue man guy, we can turn that. That'll be whatever photograph, if you choose to put an image in and the, under facial ID, the first one you enter goes up there and that becomes kind of the, the logo for this case. If we had a tattoo, let's say, let's say we had a skeletalized head, so we had a, we had a facial reconstruction done or a facial approximation done, and then we had a, a heart tattoo and it said mom in it, and we got a nice picture of that, we would choose to put that as our image. We would still put the, and we'll get to that in a minute, we would still put that facial approximation photo in there, but we wouldn't make it the main, the main one. But, uh, you know, some of the facial approximations in NamUs are horrendous. Just, they don't, to me, they don't look like people. So I don't know what good that does. But then again, I don't know how good, what good it does to put these FBI-generated ones in if they don't look like the person. You know, until more research is done, we're, never gonna, we're not going to know if they look like the person. But any image is good. Anything to replace that blue man is good. Now, in the case, we've just started this a few uh, a few weeks ago, when we, we stole the idea from Emily Craig in, in, in Kentucky, but Emily has for years now, when there's no other image available, has an has a, uh, uh, image of Kentucky and a star in the, one of the five quadrants or five locations uh, that she covers of Kentucky. So this is where the body was found. So the blue man tells you nothing except there's no images. And there may be no way to create an image. If it's just bones, there'd be maybe nothing to put to put in there. There's no, unless you have visible teeth, anterior teeth, and in a skull, I would say there's no reason to put any bone on that banner. You you can put pictures if you want and the images. If you think it might be a good thing to do, but to put it up there can't do any good unless, of course, the anterior teeth are showing. But even if you don't have any of that, you can, st and you know where the remains were found, you can still generate some kind of map, can't you? And you can put, like we're putting, we're putting stars in the, in the, deep in the desert of southern Arizona showing the Mexican border and the, with the U.S. And in case some families know something about the crossing location, that might be enough to, to get them interested. But I would say put something and get that blue man out of there. Those are you New York City. Hmm? Go ahead. I'm sorry, you were saying you wouldn't put up a decom face, but you wouldn't put up a skull. That could... Well, we, we would crop it. We, we crop it. So let's say we get something with a, a star on a tooth, a gold star. We would crop it down to you know, what I would consider non-offensive. Now, should we then put the entire skull photo in and, and you do the crop? No, 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 no. You would do that. You would do that. Yeah. And we, the people. Yeah, would. yeah. You, you, the case manager. Yeah. If you're creating that case, you, 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 now you certainly can put in a cranium. Pe people have. There, there are plenty in there. There, there are plenty in there. Uh, what good they do when they don't have any, you know. Distinguishing features on their teeth. Again, uh, you could argue that the mother of that, if that's the, if the mother is looking for her son, that would be such a turnoff to, that they wouldn't even consider that case. So you could argue that it actually does more harm than good. Well, that would be different, wouldn't it? That would be different. Yeah. If you if you had a if you had someone with a flap, a heel flap, a parietal flap, and you wanted to show that. Certainly would describe that. You would describe that under bony uh, skeletal findings, under medical intervention. I would, I, I would say, you know, I wouldn't tell you not to put a photograph of that in there. Uh, it could be a, it could be a good thing. It's unlikely the parents, or the, unless unless the surgeon is looking for this missing person, it's unlikely that anybody would ever seen that. 
but uh, 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 we haven't done that yet, but I wouldn't say that's a bad idea. It might be something, if, you're if you know your missing person had cranial surgery, and you're just thumbing through a bunch of images like that, I mean, that, that could come, that could come. And the, the, uh, the text box for the uh, photographs are also searchable. So when you do that, if you do that photograph, you'd also want to describe that this is a prior, <laughs> prior flap or, or prior cranial surgery, and then uh, that would come up, and uh, uh, you could get another possible uh, a link, link that way. So we're only concerned, and Dr. Hanslick at Fulton County, who's a, who, who, who reviews all of these, we're just concerned, I think, with putting insensitive things up there. But there are some, there are some decomposed bodies, some decomposed faces uh, on NamUs, and you know, it, it would be up. To, it would be up to you. <coughs> so we got our second star, and now I think we can move on. Okay, medical. So we here we go. Poorly healed fractures to the right clavicle, visible on X-ray. Fine. Partial hysterectomy. hysterectomy. Uh, so you can infer some of these uh, scars either from a from a hysterectomy or from an appendectomy. Uh, you can infer these things if you if you want to say inferred or you, uh, you know qualify it. You certainly can do that, but. Uh, uh, Name is searches for the word. So if you put in extra words, it'll still find hysterect hysterectomy. It'll still find epidectomy. It'll still find scar. Uh, one thing it won't do is if, if, you, if you type in gray, G-R-E-Y, like I like to do for some reason. I must have had a British professor sometime. Uh, it won't find gray. So G-R-A-Y here won't link to G-R-E-Y here. So try to use the common spelling and things that uh, people will. Uh, would we'll put in there. You could type in both. Mm. You could type in both. Absolutely. Like medical terms, you use like layman's term and physician terminology because you don't know what the family has access to or knowledge of. Yeah, so hysterectomy would be uterus not present. Right, and like lap coli and gallbladder yeah. removal. Yeah, you don't, it's a good point. You don't want to give, if, if you did a search and you got no hits or only one hit and there's 8,000 missing people in there, do another search. Think about it for a while. Like you said, add a few more words. Think about how else you could capture the same kind of condition, and you probably get a, a few more numbers than that. On the search, is there an and or function, or it's just no, just words? Yeah. It also is partial words, right? So if you put in and, you'll get grand. So sometimes, usually, what happens is you get too many, and you think why, and you have to find out why did this one come up, and then you see what your you put in evil, a tattoo that says evil, and you get all the tattoos that say devil. So you just kind of have to play with it that way. I guess, that, I guess that's by design they want to do it that way. But uh, I think it's better to get more, too many than too few. But if you, do, if you do think you get too few, and sometimes we do a search and we think, come on, somebody has got to have a tattoo that says mom, right? More than three people have to have it. And, and uh, uh, usually if you play around, uh, uh, you, you can get that. Okay, so the, uh, the, the phenotypic thing, phenotypical things we can put in there, uh, any kind of foreign objects. Uh, uh, if it has a, this, is, this goes to spec to circumstances too. If, it, if it's a homicide and it's like something that has to do with ligatures, you know, you would never put down, you know, a scarf that was holding someone's hands behind their back, you wouldn't list that as personal effect, right? You wouldn't list that as a scarf under, uh, under clothing. Nor should you put it, unless you come up, could come up with a real good reason why you think somebody reading that's name is page could, uh, that would be a good clue. Because uh, if you think about it, only the perpetrators probably know about, about that scarf around that woman's uh, wrist. But this is, stuff like that can be put in, in great detail on the police page. And the general public can't see that. Only you can see it and the, and the police can see it. So, Things that you might, uh, you know, and sometimes in the older cases, you know, we, we've done that and this, did a oops, like, oh, we shouldn't put that there because you know, she wasn't wearing that. Like, like, like we've listed one time a, a, green, a green blanket in addition to all the other stuff this person had and had a backpack. And uh, so you, you list a backpack, then you list a green blanket until you realize that she was rolled, the body was rolled up in this green blanket. There's no reason to think that was hers. So potentially all you're doing is alerting the perpetrator that that's the body. And if you think about it, there probably are, in homicide cases, the killers are looking at NamUs. By now, two years later, it's out there. People know about it. I'm sure there are some cases out there where 
men are tracking their victims. Or they, 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 that they, see that, they see that the victims were found, and now, now they're tracking what, you know, what's being added about the body. So uh, you don't want to give them any, any more additional information. So you don't want to put things that are sensitive like that that might mess up the police investigation and really uh, have no ID value except uh, to the perpetrator. Fingerprints, we can scan prints and we will do that after lunch if you want. Uh, you have to fill something out, it's a required field, so if you can't get them, you can't get them. But uh, if you can, you, uh, you, uh, you scan them in and you say that they're, or you say that they're available in a, in a certain uh, area. Uh, the codes, the old, uh, the old uh, what are they called? Uh, the, ten, the 10 codes? Henry, Henry system. Henry system. Some people put the Henry system in there. Uh, most, most cases don't have that, but there are some old-timer de old detectives, uh, people my age, a little bit older, that are still using that, and they use that as a sorting criterion. So if they, have a, if they have a missing person and they have the card out with the Henry classification, and they're just thumbing through, which you can do, you can thumb through a hundred or a thousand uh, unidentified uh, cases, just, and, and you come up on the, once you, once you start thumbing through with the, uh, you can't see it in this slide, you can just go from fingerprint page to fingerprint page to fingerprint page. So if they're looking at their classification and just kind of looking at all these UP cases, looking for the same classification, they can actually exclude, which is a good thing. We'll talk about that later. Or they can say, well, I need to look at this guy's prints. He has the same classification as my guy. But uh, most, uh, most of the cases in NamUs, if you go and look, they won't have anything in that block. And then under comments, uh, you can say uh, who has the prints or they've been submitted to APHIS, or they've been, they've been submitted to the local, uh, your local APHIS. Uh, uh, sometimes there's only partial prints, and a lot of our decomps, as you guys know, you, get, you don't get good 10 prints, you get a, a few fingers that might be okay. Uh, so you can put that in there, that which digits have been printed, and then if you can, upload, scan those prints, upload them on the images page, and uh, get them in there. We have had IDs made from uh, fingerprint examiners looking at this attests to the quality of the, the scanned images in here. Looking at the, uh, the prints in NamUs and comparing them to prints in a, in a, in a U.S. government a database, matches have been made. So if you, have good, if you have prints, especially if they're good quality, you never know what fingerprint guy might you know, decide on that day to look through all the cases, the new cases maybe for the last month or last two months that have fingerprints and then compare his missing person's fingerprints to your decedent fingerprint. Again, another thing, another great thing about NamUs, when you're not working your case, or if you have 100 cases and you can't get to all of them, you never know when someone's el someone else is working it. That's a good thing. It's a real good thing. Uh, save your changes, obviously. Go to the next page. Fingerprints, uh, as I just said. Uh, everything the up you that you upload has to be a JPEG. So whatever you have, you've got to convert it uh, in, in the images. You can put PDFs into the documents pages, but uh, JPEGs only into the, uh, into the uh, uh, images. Uh, if you're going to scan radiographs, especially dental radiographs, uh, I think it's 400 DPI. 400, I can check on this, but I believe it's 400 DPI is, uh, is re recommended. That's certainly good enough quality to, to make some uh, uh, valuable comparisons. Sometimes prints aren't available when you put the case in, or you put the case in and you don't, you, you know prints were run, you, you, get, you get reports that the prints came back negative, but you don't know where they're at. And if your jurisdiction is like ours, it might take a week or a month to get the police to actually find that, that actual print card. Lend it to you for the day so you can scan it and then get it into, a, get it into NamUs. But if that's the case, then just put down that prints aren't currently available. But uh, when you do get the prints, then go back and, and edit uh, edit this. Obviously, every field is editable. You, you, you can change anything. We, I change things from happy to glad all the time and then back to glad a week later because I forgot I changed it from happy. So you can, you can do a lot of, a, a lot of changing if, uh, if, you, if you'd like to. Clothing and accessories, uh, MLIs, uh, and our, our deaners in the office do most of this information. They collect most of the information, but it's the anthropologists in our office that actually put it in. So uh, if you're in an ME system, whether you're an anthropologist or not, you may be uh, you may be asked to, uh, to put this in. Uh, next to the facial photograph, probably clothing, for, for the families of missing people who know what that person was wearing when they went missing. And if that person is dead, probably that person was killed shortly after he or she went missing. 
Uh, the families search the clothing page all the time. They're looking for jewelry, they're looking for particular colors, particular styles of, of, uh, of clothing. Now, a lot of families don't know what the person was wearing or the person didn't, didn't die uh, right away. So, uh, but in those instances where the family is sure they know, uh, in, an, in an abduction case, they know what the person was wearing, then uh, uh, this is a really good thing to, really good thing to have, fill that accurately. So Bruce, you were saying that you wouldn't put, if someone had their hands tied with something, you wouldn't put that thinking that it might be the, the perpetrator. But, um, but what, if, what about if they've used her own scarf or something, the blindfold? Could you just say a flower was associated? Yeah. I guess if you knew that or you thought that was a strong possibility, then yeah, you could list that under personal effects. You'd also list it under, you'd, but you listed, you would list it under, well, give me an example where you would absolutely know that with this dead body that had to be her clothing item. Yeah. Let, let's, say, let's say a bra. Let's say a bra is taken off and her hands are tied with a bra. Okay. Bad example perhaps, but let's say there's something special about that bra. On the police page, you would put that a bra was used for a ligature, and she, would, she was shirtless and didn't have a bra on. But uh, let's say there's a flower or something or initials on that bra. Then on the clothing page, you would just list that bra just as if it was on her body when she came in. That's how you'd handle it.